Thank you. Yeah. Um, so Dave, I know we've, uh, we've all talked with you a few times in the past. Um, Cindy, have you had a chance to look at any of the remediation control issues we've created yet um, for infra? We need to walk through those or kind of bring you up to speed. Uh, yeah, can we, can we walk through those really quick? Sure. Yeah, I don't think I've talked her through those. So thanks for joining. <laughs> And welcome, Cindy. Thing. It's so glad yeah. to have you on the SRE team. Thank you, Mel. Glad to be here. So I'm going to share my screen. All right. So um, we created a specific board um, based on the compliance infrastructure scope label that um, we've identified all of the controls where infrastructure is going to be the owner of that control. And uh, so it's very basic. It's just, we have a bunch that have been closed so far, but we still, we also have some that are open. Um, most are going to be around vulnerability management, system monitoring, and identity access management and encryption. Um, a few of these are going to be related to the SOX audit that we have coming up um, in, um, in, that will begin in Q1 of 2020. Um, most specifically um, on this board is going to be the um, infrastructure patch management, um, which just they to have- Just calendar, <clears throat> you're saying calendar year 2020, so you mean in January, right? Not in February. Yeah. No, no, fiscal, sorry. Fiscal, okay, so just making yeah. sure I understood, okay. Yeah, that's good. Um, <clears throat> the, for strangely, oh, I shouldn't say strangely, the audit, internal audit goes on our fiscal calendar. So luckily we always are kind of one. Oh yeah, one no, I'm, I'm getting used to talking everything in fiscal, but I just yes. wanted to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So how um, each control will be unique and how it will be addressed and, and, and um, how we'll get to that to a place of 100% remediation. Um, I know for some of us, we have looked at trying to address these controls by end of calendar year this year, 2019. Hi, Jen. And um, so that will allow for time for us to do validation testing and make sure that we are at 100% before we pass that off to internal audit um, for them to begin their um, uh, independent uh audit. So Nick, do you think we have time to go through at a very, very high level, each one of these families? I mean, probably the infrastructure patch management, the policy and the schedule. I know that's one that specifically um, Dave and I spoke about. Cindy, you and I could maybe partner with. I could help um, write up the policy. I mean, currently it's, um, it, it doesn't have to be we're, we're gonna do this in keeping with our value of iteration. So we're not talking about having the most robust policy out there, but just kind of a policy stating something very standard and, and what probably mirroring what we're already doing. Cause I know that you guys are doing weekly automated patching. So um, I think that's still the case, right, Dave? Yeah, <clears throat> no, okay. and I was gonna try so to participate in this too. Um, but yeah, I think and sorry, Nick, for being quiet lately, but I was waiting and oh, now no understanding the scope of this. I was like, it's nice to batch all this documentation up so that <clears throat> we're writing a, a couple of policies at the same time. Um, it's because it solves mentally. Like the other thing that I spoke with Melissa about is like last week when we were syncing up was just real, me realizing like <clears throat> it would be nice to just decide where in the handbook exactly are we recording this so that we don't have it scattered in like five different places in the infrastructure handbook or something to. Um, so I think we'll make sure we solve that problem too. If I'm gonna, if we're gonna address all of these different things, let's address them in one policy right up in one place in the handbook. That's great. That will make things a lot easier for everyone. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so I think we, you know, we probably just pick one issue, start with it, but then at least we know that in that place in the handbook is now where we can add to the rest of these other policy write-ups. Correct. And I believe, you know, and I think while we're at it, you know, all of this can probably go all of these um, 
these issues related to infrastructure patch management, it will all be in the handbook. So it can all be addressed at the same time. So we're going to be getting a lot of birds with one stone. Yeah. And my hope would be like we <clears throat> once kind of Cindy and Mel and I agree and kind of write up the first one. I think after that, Cindy, like you and I can then farm it out to like, we'll see if we can get two or three, if there's like eight more issues to do, maybe we can get two other people to help us and we can just write a bunch of stuff in parallel. Yeah, that's, that sounds like a good plan. Um, what is, what did the, what does writing one consist of? Like, do we have an example or? Yeah, well, I can certainly provide you. I think um, the policy uh, would just state um, patching is performed on a weekly basis and any patches that fail are addressed, for example. That can be something as simple as that. And then we would support how you're doing that. So then we have the schedule. So the schedule would simply be, is it every two weeks? We would want to be able to validate what that schedule was. And Nick, please jump in if I'm, if sure. I'm over speaking. Um, validate what the schedule is. So we would take a look at the infrastructure and how you have the, the patches scheduled, right? And get some screenshots like that. Um, validation, just to validate when the patch is applied, if it, how, how the system goes about saying, yep, the patch applied or the patch didn't apply. And, and it's really just walking through your process. It's putting words to what you guys are already doing. So I, there's a little blurb that I use when we talk um, to customers, they ask us about patch management. It's actually something that um, in speaking with Dave and Northrop way back when, he kind of, the group just walked us through what you do. I could actually send you that. And then from that, you and I could build out, make sure that all these separate sections are addressed. And what we would do is we'll just create a page in the handbook. Yeah, that another thing I was- straightforward. Well, go on. I was gonna say another um, uh, place we could point you to is um, on the security ops side, they uh, went through and added their vulnerability, vulnerability management overview page. And from their perspective, um, within the same, same domain family, they went through and just knocked all of those um, control, remediation control issues out. And that's all in there. So it can kind of give you an idea of how they went about it to see like the format And that's probably going to be the only place where we're going to have to coordinate um, outside of infrastructure would be how we're going to address any of the patching or any of the vulnerabilities that are surfaced after um, as a result of the tenable IO scanning. Wouldn't that be correct, Nick? Uh, can you repeat that? So the only the, because infrastructure already has automated weekly patching, um, mm -hmm. that's just um, I think it's Linux patches, right? Dave and security patches, things that we get from our... Yeah, it's just whatever okay. Ubuntu is patching. Ubuntu. So, so the only thing that we're going to have to probably coordinate with, um, or and it, it's determined what SLA there might be for any patching that would need to be done as a result of the Tenable IO scans. Yeah, actually, right. I think Tenable is partially the evidence for the auditors of the patching policy. <laughs> In an yeah, ideal yeah. world, and I'm not going to say I'm not going to say it's <laughs> ideal, but in an ideal world, Tenable should be running on whatever recurring basis we decide to run it on, and we should be able to take those scans on those dates and provide them as evidence relative to the patches and when they came out. Exactly. So, I think that this one, um, at least from an MVC perspective. Um, there's quite a bit to work with Cindy, so we can set up some time over the next few weeks if you want. And, and put this together. Um, and I yeah, would just say so the by first the, iteration so, is just pushing out what we do have. So ideally, like before December 20th or so, we've got most of these documented out, would be kind of what you're thinking. Oh, yes, yeah, certainly. I was gonna say okay. that I would put some time on her calendar the week after Thanksgiving, sure. and we would, we would just get it out there, what we have. Yeah. yeah, and I'd be happy to participate in one or two of those too. Okay. Some days are better, some days Same. are worse. So, <laughs> Or we could just, if it's easier, we could just tag you in in the MR because we're going to be that efficient. That'd be fine. Well, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm happy to collaborate on whatever I can help. So Nick, do you think there's anything in here that's a little more, um, uh, not quite as uh, obvious as to obvious. what it is that we're looking at? Right. Um, the The only thing... And, and Jen and Usha, please jump out if there's anything yep. we should address and I'll open it. Um, 
The other one, Dave, that I wanted to bring it up was the backup management, the alternate storage. I've been pinging you and um, you already know that you are the owners for that, but just wanted to bring it to your attention and say that there is one more. The other backup configuration has already been closed. This is the one that um, I'm currently working on, which is mostly dependent on the geo, geo part. Um, you could probably tell me who would be the POC for this, and I could probably talk to him directly. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I guess my question on alternate storage, since we have a chance to look at this right now, is um, can I get a definition of alternate location? Does it mean alternate cloud provider or just alternate geography? <laughs> well, per the definition, it's both. But um, most of the... Cloud providers, they actually do not tell you the geographical location, so to speak. But when it comes to a DR, we, are, we always want such a way that the geographical location is not in the same location where your primary site is. Then oh, yeah. No, and, and we site. can, uh, and I'm fine with the control statement and putting in some language that we have an alternate geography, geographic location, um, alternate cloud provider location for the backup of the data or, you know, alternate ultimate <clears throat> vendor of the backups, that is an open discussion that if we want to go down that route, then that's something we don't have. We would need to come up with a plan. <laughs> right now, I'll, I'll be writing the policy is that, you know, we use Google alternate locations, but it's all on Google's control. So, um, you know, if we're talking about different vendors for ultimate backup of some of this kind of stuff, then I'll need to, we'll need to make that a different compliance gap to figure out. Usha, would, or, or Dave, wouldn't this, part of me thinks that this, considering our primary, um, the primary data center is US 1 East, right? What we right. tell customers is based on what um, infrastructure, Dave, you've, your group has provided information on, is that the backups are stored in regional buckets. So regional Correct. buckets by in itself already means that it's alternate. It could potentially be um, U.S. Central or U.S. West would be other locations. U.S. That, Central, yes, U.S. West. So, yeah. so with that, um, at least for now, that meet covers the, the ultimate of the... Yeah. Yes, it does. Yeah, I just okay. meant like we're not using an Iron Mountain or backing up to S3 or something else as an alternate cloud provider. Um, to just or, you know, provider scope, for backups. Yeah, for now, just to keep the scope limited, probably I could I could spin it this way, and it it would suffice this control. And aren't we looking at a DR as a separate control? So we're not necessarily Correct. relying on this backup alternate storage, Usha, to, to meet the burdens of what our DR or our BC plan, business continuity, disaster okay. recovery. So yeah, I correct. think that as long as we could get some evidence, Dave, from your group about the regional buckets in Central or West, mm -hmm. um, I think that we would be fine here. And I'm yeah. not one to, I don't like to scope controls down because we don't have the things in place because then that defeats the whole purpose of our work but i do think based on the fact that you do have the regional buckets for backup this this control is limited it, this control shouldn't be what we use to support our disaster recovery business continuity sure no and, that, and that's what i meant it's, i was just that's why i was trying to be careful about the definition of location um because yes i i, I totally agree with that and it was just one of those ones of depending and I guess you know this is where this control to me wanders that lot that other piece of again we're still looking from the input from the business of do you want us to use an iron mountain or something like that to ultimately store backups somewhere else entirely different from the vendor and the location that we currently use <clears throat> if that is the case we need that input from the business that's not I don't know if that's an infrastructure decision or not right and that's something um, that I think Walter um, Usha and I are meeting with Walter okay. To, to see where they are on that. But okay. for this one, um, given that it, you own the control, I'd mm -hmm. like to re leave the scope limited to sure. our no, daily, we'll document our, it regular, as yeah. our regular no. routine regional Yeah, backups. so that goes back to the first point of what we first talked We'll document it as is, and then Perfect. if that's good enough, then we'll discuss it later on. That makes sense. Okay. Great. Um, so that makes sense. I think in looking at those, if we're okay taking a little bit more, when I look at the board, um, I see the, oh no, that's SAST and dependency scheming for customers. That's fine. So <clears throat> um, 
the secure audit on, logging. I was going to ask, are those are those on track uh, customers in Ghibli? Um, yeah, the customer should still be done by the end of the year. Moving version over, we found the number of bugs and auto DevOps and other things that we've been dealing with, but I still think customers should be able to get these done by the end of the year. Um, right. License may still be in AWS before <clears throat> that may go into January. Um, I'm less worried about the AWS environment than the Azure one, so I'd rather get customers done sooner. Um, okay. <clears throat> the but the when I when I look at these, I think the other conversation to have is um, when I look at like app analysis, Sys 102 secure audit logging. Um, this is a control to me that's blended. That you say the control owner is security operations, the process owner is infrastructure. So is that is this a case where the policy is going to be written up by both of us? Because you know the audit logging and the processing, and like <clears throat> yeah, the process owner, the like infrastructure will help, help set up. Obviously, we control how we ship logs out of the environment, but I thought overall control owner belonged with SecOps and Paul's team because they're, I thought they were the ones looking at the audit logs. You know, They're running whatever SIM or other tool they're doing to look for activity. Is that correct? Cor correct. Um, but this would be around how you are securing the logging of information come of logs coming off of gitlab.com uh -huh. assets since those are owned by infrastructure you know where that is ultimately residing oh, which okay. i'm guessing <clears throat> is an elk elk instance you know mm -hmm. uh validating that those cannot be altered um and you know it's least privilege that sure. can't be disabled okay. that kind of got thing it. got it yeah no that makes sense now and nick that would be for the definition of production that we have for all of the in scope, so it's not just necessarily um, GCP. Yeah, this is, it's it's also yeah. This is GitLab.com customers license yeah, version. Okay, good. Yeah. Right. So yeah, it, all anything with GitLab.com would fall on infrastructure. Everything else falls on mm -hmm. SecOps. Yeah, and in that case, that's again where <clears throat> for this Sys 102, I'm looking at issue 1010. That's where, you know, like these are ones where I'd subdivide of what, what we need to write up in the policy is this is how we do log shipping for the GitLab.com environment. This is how we do log shipping for customers. This is how we do log shipping for a version. Um, and in that case, I expect there to be different techniques on how we log ship. And I expect there to be significantly larger gaps for customers version and license than there are for .com. Okay. Just telling you for what I expect to see at the moment, as in, I'm pretty sure we do not ship logs from customer at all right now. Right. And I know that has come up in the past so. um, that we've discussed. So, but it, it's great that we're getting this out there in the open now so that we can yeah. start addressing it. Yeah. So that's the one where when we move it to GCP, the plan was at that point, we'll be addressing log shipping at that point when we do that project. So hopefully that stuff still falls into place correctly. Okay, great. Are there still, is there a time frame? I'm not pressing you. A time frame for the migration? Um, it's still hopefully happening um, after Thanksgiving. Okay. Um, but we had, um, this is just the level that I'm at at the moment, that Devin, who is working on things related to customers, um, this quarter we're actually focusing on working with Geo too. <laughs> so Devin is now um, double booked of, he's okay. also the, stable counterpart for geo and working very heavily with trying to get geo working and i also had him working on customers so we're trying to um balance that out <laughs> that that just happened in the last week or two so i'm kind of in the wait and see mode of how much time is geo going to take from Devin, and if that looks like it's at risk of delaying getting customers over we'll get somebody else to help him out and ultimately it might be a decision that if if we say that we're coming up because the audit logging for customers will be important because customers is in scope for the SOX audit. Yeah. Um, they don't necessarily <clears throat> care the internal auditors where it is located. They're not focusing on PCI, but they will be focusing on making sure we do have logs. So I don't oh, know. Oh, that's good to know. Okay. At the end of the day, if it's going to be quicker, no, I'm not saying quicker, but the first iteration will yeah. be, is it going to be easier, less resource intensive to ship logs from... Well, that makes sense. 
or to migrate. So, so just keep that in mind because really. Oh yeah, no, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, no. So I'll, I'll reevaluate that. Cause yeah, no, that's a good thing to point out. No, I hadn't thought of it that way. Nick, um, are you comfortable with what I just said? Yes. Okay. Okay. That's good to know. Um, I'll make sure that I think about that then. Cause yeah, we're in the, we're just in a wait and see mode is basically, I was hoping that after Thanksgiving week, we should be able to start doing that move, but I'll check with Devin on that and see how that's going. And at that point, we'll just see who else we can pull in because yeah, maybe in that case, we just set up log shipping to push to elk. Makes sense. Great. Um, anything else before I ask, or uh, Jen, is there anything you would like to discuss? Um, yeah, so I'm just, I'm working on a few things where infrastructure are, is actually the process owner. Mm -hmm. I only have one where um, infra is the control owner. And I think that one I'm, I'm pretty good for right now. Um, it's, it's just in connection with search code management. So um, using GitLab, you know, assigning permissions to the project for um, GitLab.com. So I, I'll have questions for you when once I have them. I'm working through that right now. But really the ones that uh, Infra is the process owner for, um, those I would definitely need some help. Let me just get the issue number. Um, so it, just as a summary, they're in connection with the production diagrams. We really just need to get some items updated on that. And so I have... Um, SecOps as the control owner, but Infra as the process owner that would actually own the diagrams. Is that right? It may be the case there, yeah. Um, I just need to see the particular issue. Cool. And feel free to drop something on my calendar and I can add people as needed and we can figure out what to do there. Perfect. I'll do that. Thank you. Great. Um, I think we've covered everything. Was there anything else on your side, Dave or Cindy, you'd like to go over? Um, Not off the top of my head. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, no, no. Uh, same. I'm, I'm probably just going to read through these issues and if okay. I don't have any questions, I'll just ask. Uh, sure, and we'll sync up too. I just added you after Mel and I chatted late last week. So. Um, yep. And it's I think nice. At least we've got a batch shipping. of these now. So go ahead. I was going to say, I think the log shipping, we can start the same way with, as we're doing with the patch management policy. So it can be um, pretty straightforward that. Yeah, no, well, I think you're right. Like back to the core first part of the message, let's document what we have. And then that'll give us gaps where we've got certain gaps and that'll give us time to then like you, Nick, you said at the beginning of at that point, then if we've got everything documented for what we have in mid December, then that gives you a chance to look over the, what we do have and fix some of those further gaps before we see auditors in February. So that makes sense. Correct. Um, so other, uh, how, how often should we have this meeting that would be beneficial for you all? Um, I kind of lean towards every other week. I don't know that we need weekly. Okay. And is there a particular time in the week that works better for you? Uh, day, you know, early in the week, later in the week? <laughs> um, actually, Thursday or Friday for some of these kinds of meetings work a little better for me because I just recently realigned and pushed all my one-on-ones to Monday through Wednesday. So, um, okay. Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday morning, um, can, I can do it. Cindy, I don't know how early you start, but I occasionally start at 7 o'clock here for me. So... Um, I can go as early as that, but uh, yeah, okay. some of those times. But my Thursdays and Fridays are more open on my calendar than Tuesday, which looks like a horrible game of Tetris right now. My calendar is pretty open, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I will, I will find something um, at uh, maybe the end of next week. Yeah, uh, well, end of next week or out Thursday, Friday. So, um, Is that next week? Yes, I guess so. Thanksgiving, my dear. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, I'll look for something the week after. Well, if you wanted to try to get something in on Wednesday, we can do it. So, okay, I'll see what we can do. Um, 
if there's nothing else, I will um, give you all a couple minutes back. Yeah, thank thanks. you very much for taking the time. No, and thanks thanks for bugging me on it. It makes sense. Now we got this patched up. I think we can power through a bunch of these. And it shouldn't be too bad to get up. So Great to hear. we'll get caught up. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. Ooh. It was good. It was a good, good meeting. <laughs>